The history of math is our intellectual foundation to understanding science. Science, beautiful, awesome, wonderful science. It's the creative foundation to our ineffable future. Hi, I'm Gabrielle Burchak, and this is my podcast, Math, Science, History. I often promote my website, mathsciencehistory.com, which I built myself. Of all the hosts that I've been with, my experience with Bluehost has been the best. What I really like about Bluehost is their customer service. It is top notch and they are always there to help me. So if you're looking to build a website or you're looking to move to a new host, I highly recommend Bluehost. You can access Bluehost through my affiliate link, which is www.bluehost.com com slash track t-r-a-c-k slash math science history all one word bluehost is fantastic and they are affordable it's only $3.95 a month if you sign up for 36 months so if you do the math it's $142 to start and for me it was the smartest business investment i've ever made in heaven there is no beer that's why we drink it here and when we're gone from here our friends will be drinking all the beer the year was 1972 the place the rocky mountains just outside of denver colorado my dad was a deburring operator at sunstrand aviation and his company was having a fourth of july company cookout there were potato sack races and three-legged races and all kinds of fun things to do for the family then came the talent portion for anybody that entered they would win a six-pack of beer well my dad loved his beer every day at 3 30 he'd get home from work go down to the basement where he made this gorgeous recreation of a saloon complete with a beer tap a bar old-time stools and even a spittoon so when the talent portion came he knew exactly what he was going to do to win that six-pack of beer he looked at me and said sing for me stinky pants yes stinky pants was what my dad called me for obvious reasons <laughs> <laughs> and though I was only six, I knew a few songs, one of which was my dad's favorite, In Heaven There Is No Beer. And so began my foray into the world of entertainment. My dad put me up on the picnic table at performance time and I belted out his favorite song to the cheering crowd. Guess who won? I did. But since I was only six, my dad got the beer and he gave me two dollars. My dad and I made quite a team that day. And to this day, even though he's no longer in the world, I still consider him as part of my team. Growing up, he always encouraged me to love mathematics, which then led to my love of history, which then led to my love for the subject of Mesopotamia, which then led me to think about beer in Mesopotamia. Making beer is actually an easy process. However, making good beer is not so easy, and history tells us this story. As we all know, the basic ingredients of beer are water, barley, yeast, and hops. Beer is definitely not a new invention. Some of our first creations of this delightfully brewed grain go back as far as 10,000 BCE in the region of Godin Tepe, which is now modern-day Iran. It would make sense because this was when agriculture was first developing in this region. So, while humans were evolving and going through the process of searching for food and shelter, possibly they discovered by letting fruits ferment with wild yeast, the outcome would have an intoxicant intoxicating effect. Max Nelson in his book The Barbarian's Beverage notes that alcoholic beverages were possibly even made as early as the Neolithic period, which was actually pre-agricultural, meaning it was before 10,000 BCE. Other early evidence comes from the Shang Dynasty in China, where archaeologists found tightly sealed vessels with liquids in them. When they extracted the potsherds, they discovered traces of compounds that are found in rice, 
honey, and fruit. This was evidence of fermented drinks, and this dated back to 7,000 BCE. Additionally, some of our earliest pottery from 6,000 to 5,000 BCE, found in a location called Haji Farouz Tipi, also in Iran, was found with trace amounts of grape juice and resin, which meant they were making wine. Then, archaeologists found pottery in Godin Tipi that dates as far back as 5,000 BCE that, in addition to trace amounts of juice and resin, also had trace amounts of a pale yellowish residue in the grooves, which meant they were actually making beer. So beer dates back as far as 5000 BCE. By 2500 BCE, in the early dynastic period, beer was being made and had five designations, golden, dark, sweet dark, red, and strained. By the third period of Ur, beer was classified by its strength, which was ordinary good and very good. Obviously, good is subjective. Now, during this time, beer was brewed in clay pots. It had absolutely no carbonation and had a really low alcohol content. So, though it may have been good per se, it may not have been strong. And as with most ancient discoveries, some of our earliest records of brewing come from cuneiform tablets made by an individual who accounted for delivery reports, monthly accounts, estimates, and rations of all the ingredients that were required to brew a nice beer. So, leave it to the accountants to walk us through history and lead us to the beer. This particular cuneiform tablet I'm referring to is known as the Alulu Beer Receipt from the city of Ur. I will post that image of the beer receipt on my website at mathsciencehistory.com because it's pretty cool to see. Beer Beer was served as a meal supplement, and it was porridge-like. It was made from bipar, which is actually barley bread, and it was consumed through a straw. This particular kind of beer was actually baked twice. I'm also going to post an image of this on my website at mathsciencehistory.com. It is of a cylinder seal and its impression on clay that depicts a banquet scene of people drinking out of a vat from large reed straws. And though the image dates from 2500 BCE, we still do the same thing today with plastic straws, a large plastic container, and a drink commonly referred to as suck it from the bucket. If accounting is not enough evidence for some of our earliest transactions of beer, we also have drinking songs and poems that celebrate this delightful beverage. And though the songs weren't nearly as great as In Heaven There Is No Beer, they were definitely worth remembering. Or maybe not. These hits include the Hymn of Ninkasi from 1800 BCE, the Epic of Gilgamesh from 2700 BCE, and the Sumerian poem Inanna and the God of Wisdom that tells the story of many gods drinking together. And in the story, the God of Wisdom, Enki, becomes so drunk on beer that he actually gives away the sacred laws of civilization. By 1800 BCE, beer was being made specifically by women who were known as the priests of Ninkasi. The drinking of beer and alcohol became so serious that the Code of Hammurabi dictated that if a woman tending bar short measured a drink for a customer, she would be drowned to death. By the year 600 of our current era, during the Middle Ages, the Brewers Guild adopted patron saints of brewing. This was the Middle Ages, also known as the Dark Ages. Thus, it would make sense that people would want to drink probably for the same reasons that we are drinking today. However, the beer that was made at this time took place in churches and was brewed by monks. This was actually a good time for beer because these monks had time to educate themselves about how to make the perfect brew. They could perfect the vines and fermentation processes, which resulted in a quality beer. This quality beer soon became a commodity as many could use beer to pay their taxes and buy items. As a result, beer became a valuable commodity of the elite. About a hundred years later, around 700 in our current era, beer makers began adding hops to the beers, along with flavorings that included mushrooms, honey, sugar, bay leaves, and butter. These hops were valuable because they added flavor. They subdued the sweetness of the beer, added oils, and increased the shelf life of the beer and helped to prevent spoiling. Then between the late 8th century to 1100, the Vikings raided and took over the coastal regions of Europe. They gained control of areas 
nations, including Scotland, Iceland, Greenland, and conducted trade as far as the Byzantine Empire. And with the Vikings came beer. The Viking beer consisted of 9% alcohol and was considered dark, sweet, and malty. Viking beer was so dense that the Vikings had to strain their ale before they drank it. And we know this because archaeologists actually found ale strainers in their graves. By 1516, Germany implemented the Beer Purity Law, which was the first German law to govern German food. The law was created because people were brewing their beer with multiple ingredients some of which included poisonous mushrooms, which they didn't realize were poisonous until after the people were getting sick. The purity law stated that brewers could only make their beer with the essentials, which were malted barley, hops, yeast, and water. These four ingredients were essential for the German beers, and they were now the law. The combination is actually ideal. The malted barley adds the sweet taste of sugar, but when heated to the point of boiling, it creates ethanol. The barley also gives us amino acids, which allowed for healthy yeast growth. The yeast serves as a catalyst to convert the sugar into ethanol. This ethanol is antibacterial, which allows the beer to have a longer shelf life. And the water helps the yeast to make carbohydrates. It provides a proper pH balance and implements the proper calcium and magnesium levels. Thus, the beer purity law was implemented and is still employed today and for some is considered the guardian of beer quality. During World War I and the Great Beer Tax Debate, a Bavarian legislator gave this purity law a name, calling it Reinheitsgebot. However, this purity law made it difficult for beer imports in Germany. And so, in 1987, after French brewers complained about Reinheitsgebot, the EU Court of Justice struck down the law, which allowed for more imports. As for the United States, with the exception of prohibition in the 1920s, beer has been imported into the state since 1607. Then, in the late 1800s, as German immigrants began to arrive on Mexico's soil, breweries began to pop up in Mexico. In 1925, using Germany's concoction, a new brewery, Grupo Modelo, created a beer that over time would become the most imported beer in the United States, the delicious Corona. In 1937, Modelo began to create and market the Corona Extra, which was marketed as a quality beverage. By 1976, areas around the United States, like New York and my hometown, Denver, Colorado, began to create something like a black market for the Corona Extra. I remember this well. Well, because the first time my dad tried Corona Extra in 1978, he loved it. It reminded him of the German beers he used to drink in his hometown Crabtree, Pennsylvania. There you have it, my story of beer that just went full circle. So, this 4th of July weekend, however you plan to celebrate it, stay safe, my friends. Wear a mask, keep your distance, and most importantly, don't spill your beer. I'm Gabrielle Burchak. This podcast has been brought to you by Caffeine. Delicious, wonderful, nectar of the gods caffeine. Coffee, tea, coffee candy, you name it. I love it. Thank you for listening to Math Science History. If you like what you are listening to, please remember to subscribe and leave a review. I would really appreciate that. If you are interested in reading more about the history of math and science, please come visit me at mathsciencehistory.com. And while you are there, if you like what you're listening to, please feel free to click on that coffee button and buy me a cup of coffee. Until next week, carpe diem. <coughs> <laughs> Too much beer.